Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the Nobel Prize Dialogue Tokyo 2019, entitled The Age to Come. First, as a representative of the co-organizer, Dr. Susumu Satomi, president of the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, will offer his opening remarks on behalf of the organization. Dr. Satomi, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Asumi Satomi, President of Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. On behalf of the organizer of this event, I am pleased to offer a few remarks at the opening of this Nobel Prize Dialogue of Tokyo 2019. His Excellency Magnus Lohbach, Ambassador of Sweden, his Excellency Masahiko Shibayama, Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, Technology, Nobel laureate, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, I extend you all our warmest welcome to this year's Nobel Prize Dialogue. I wish to begin by acknowledging the strong support and long enjoyed cooperation accorded us by Dr. Lashu Heikenstein, Executive Director of the Nobel Foundation, and by the member of Nobel Media, headed by its acting CEO, Mrs. Laura Spreshman. I also wish to extend our hearty thanks to Nagase Brother Inc and Yakult Honsha Company Limited who are their contribution as the event partner and to Kao Corporation as a supporting organization. We greatly appreciate all the sponsoring company and organization who are their valuable contribution to today's event. The Japan Society for the Promotion of Science was established by wake of an imperial endowment in 1932. Over the some 80 years since then, the SPS has initiated and carried out a broad range of the program, pivotal to advancing scientific research in Japan. Our purpose is holding Nobel Prize Dialogue Tokyo is to enhance the public life of science. This Japan event derives its inspiration from Nobel Week Dialogue held each year in Sweden on the day before the Nobel Prize Award Ceremony. Today's event is the fourth in a series of dialogues held in Japan. Today's topic is the TA to come. As uh, president of JSPS, I am delighted to witness a flourishing interest among so many people in how advanced in the science and humanity are creating society in which people can enjoy greater longevity. To help us advance that discussion, I am excited to announce that we are joined by 19 leading scientists and thinkers, including five Nobel laureates. They have come from near and far to edify us on various aspects on the team, including an issue related to living in aging society, technological innovation made to benefit to the elderly, and the progress advanced in research on anti-aging. And especially hearty thanks goes to today's panelists who have taken time out of their busy schedule to take part in this special event. As one of the world's fastest aging society, Japan attracted considerable attention from the international community. 
as society faces a new issue engendered by greater longevity, the question is how we will tackle them. In seeking the answer, I believe it highly meaningful to engage in dialogue and discussion such as we go today that draw upon collective intellect and wisdom of humankind. As you participate in this process, I hope you will all enjoy today's Nobel Prize Dow Tokyo 2019. Thank you very much for your attention. Next, Dr. Lars Hakenstein, Executive Director of the Nobel Foundation, will offer his remarks on behalf of the Foundation. Dr. Hakenstein, please. Your uh, Excellencies, dear laureates, ladies and gentlemen, friends. Ohayo gozaimasu. It is now the fourth time that I have the privilege of uh, welcoming you all to Nobel Prize Dialogue in Japan. When I did this the first time in 2015, it was also the first time that we did a dialogue in outside Sweden. Since then, we have been to many countries, this year already to Santiago, and we will later on in the spring go to Madrid. Japan was a natural country in which to begin with your scientific traditions and your many laureates and great scientific achievements. Also, we had in your country a potential partner, the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, which was an old friend of ours and uh, whom we had been doing things and have been doing other things with afterwards. Thank you, Dr. Satomi and your collaborators for helping us over these years and for putting this event up today. Let me begin uh, these opening remarks with a bit of a background. It all started with, with Alfred Nobel. He was a Swedish scientist and an entrepreneur who built a uh, worldwide company based on the invasion of, uh, invention of, of, of dynamite. But he was much more than that. He, he was a product of, of the Enlightenment with a very strong belief in, in human power. Um, he had broad interests, including literature and philosophy, and was also very much engaged in the peace issue. When his will was opened in 1896, it was revealed that he wanted almost everything he had to be sold and the returns to be used uh, to bestow prizes on those who had made the greatest benefit to humankind. And he pointed out the, the subjects, uh, physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, and peace. Later on, economics has been added. We award the prices uh, or the prize that bears Nobel's name with the strong belief that the world can become a better place. If we build our societies on, on science and on humanistic values, and, we, and if we are prepared to invest in this and do all this in the spirit of peace and cooperation. The prize has now been awarded for 117 years to more than 900 laureates. As you probably know, 27 of these have been from Japan, 23 of them in the sciences. Today, the Nobel Prize has a very strong and almost unique position. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, it is the world's most prestigious prize. For those of us who work with the Nobel Prize, this represents a great responsibility. It's especially true in these times when much of what Alfred Nobel stood for is being questioned. Even in the traditionally democratic world, science is under threat. 
Facts, for example, about climate change are being denied almost every day. With both peace and humanistic values being threatened, the Nobel Prize, of course, gains an even greater symbolic importance. As I mentioned, Alfred Nobel wanted his prize to be awarded to those who had conferred the greatest benefit to mankind. In other words, it was not just an ordinary prize. He wanted his prize to achieve something. We have taken this to heart in our outreach activities. Of course, we provide information about Alfred Nobel, about the Nobel Prize, about the many laureates, about their achievements. But we want to do more than only spread knowledge. We want to stimulate, we want to engage, especially young people, to dedicate themselves to science, to defend humanistic values, and to work for peace, and indeed for a better world. It is in this spirit that we organize Nobel Prize Dialogue. The theme of today's conference, the age to come, is aging. In many ways, this theme is perfect for a conference of this kind. Scientific advances in, in many different fields, combined with changing patterns of life, have brought about a drastically changed age culture in much of the world. We are getting older. Fundamentally, of course, this is a good thing. But it also creates challenges. All of us would like to live long, but none would like to be old, said Benjamin Franklin. How can we as old live a good life? How should our societies be organized so that they will function well economically under the new circumstances and maintain the links that are so necessary for us as humans between generations? These questions are, are partly scientific, but they are also in clo closely involved with the humanities and with moral and ethical issues. And they are connected to the issue of peace. Today, we will meet Nobel laureates whose contributions have been crucial, as well as many of the best researchers now active in the field of aging. Also, we're reaching out to the general public and to decision makers. Together, they will highlight the existing things that are happening in this field and the challenges that we must confront as individuals and societies. Dialogues is exactly, dialogue is exactly what we want to see here today. On stage between the participants, in the auditorium with all of you involved, of course, online via our webcast and through our social media channels. We strongly believe in dialogue as a method of change. Once again, welcome all of you to Nobel Prize Dialogue here in Yokohama. And thank you for coming. Next, Mr. Masahiko Shibayama, Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology of Japan, will offer his remarks. Minister Shibayama, please. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Masahiko Shibayama, uh, Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology of Japan. Uh, it is a real a privilege to say a few words at the start of this Nobel Prize Dialogue, Tokyo 2019. Uh, I am truly pleased that this Nobel Prize Dialogue is held today through the joint sponsorship of JSPS and the Nobel Foundation, with the attendance of Nobel laureates around the world, and many figures involved and interested in science. Well, this is the fourth Nobel Prize dialogue in Japan. With the theme of the age to come, today's discussion will cover 
living in an aging society, technological innovation for the elderly, and frontiers in life science on the aging prevention. I think these are the issues that the international community as a whole must tackle and the important themes in the rapidly aging societies in the world. Today, uh, as you know, Professor Tasuku Honjo, the 2018 Nobel Laureate in Physiology or Medicine, will give us a lecture entitled Serendipities of Acquired Immunity. And Professor Randy Sheckman, the 2013 Nobel Laureate, will also give us a lecture related to the challenge to Parkinson's disease. Uh, today's program will give us many, many, many insights and suggestions about the aging society from various perspectives. I hope that today is a day fruitful for all of us, raise interest in science, and contribute to progress of science. I am aware that the distinguished achievements of the Nobel laureates here today were accomplished through assiduous efforts on their studies and by overcoming numerous difficulties since earlier years of their career. We next are pursuing a long-term vision as it redoubles its efforts to encourage academic research providing ongoing support for work based on the original thinking of researchers and for basic research. To that end, we are supporting young researchers who will lead their fields in future, and we are creating an appealing research environment. Finally, I would like to express my gratitude to JSPS and to the Nobel Foundation for providing this tremendous opportunity for us all. Thank you very much. Minister Shibayama will now depart due to official duties. Minister Shibayama, thank you very much. From here, I will pass on to Dr. Adam Smith, Chief Scientific Officer of the Nobel Media, who will give you an overview of the program today. Dr. Smith, the stage is yours. Good morning, everybody. So, as Ms. Kashiwagi says, I'm Adam Smith, and it's my pleasure to once again be your guide to today's Nobel Prize Dialogue. As those of you who've been to previous dialogues will know, my role is actually twofold. I'm both your guide and your timekeeper. So, we have a very full program to get through. Let's get started. We begin with an introductory lecture from Professor Sarah Harper, Professor of Gerontology at the University of Oxford, introducing us to the idea of why population aging matters. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Harper. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you in particular to the Nobel Prize Dialogue Committee for choosing aging, which is obviously one of the great challenges of the 21st century, and also for inviting me uh, to give this lecture. I'm a demographer, so I believe that population is understanding population aging is essential at the population level and not just at the individual level. And what I want to try and show in this introductory lecture is that population aging is affecting us at the global, the regional, the country level, as well as at the individual level. <clears throat> in fact, one of the really key statistics is if we look at the way that the population is going to grow globally, we're going to go from about 7 billion to about 10 billion by about 2050, roughly one third of that increase is due to population aging. Because remember, Population aging at that level is as much about falling fertility as increasing longevity. 
So the fertility in most countries of the world, the childbearing rate is going down, but as we live longer, so it is living longer that is actually increasing our population. But it isn't just at the global level, uh, it's very clearly also at the regional and country level. And if you look at this map, which is uh, UN statistics, uh, and you look at the red, the blue, and the green, that represents countries of the world which, by 2050, will have more than a fifth, a quarter, and a third of their population aged over 60. And you can very clearly see that it is only really sub-Saharan African countries that will still be predominantly young. The rest of the world is going to be increasingly older. But of course, one of the things we're concerned about is population aging from an individual point of view, so individual aging. And I want to um, start with this. This is the world's first supercentenarian. That's somebody who lived uh, over 110 years. Uh, we don't know much about him. Uh, we believe um, Gert Adrian's Boomgaard holds that record. Uh, all we know is that he came from the Low Countries, somewhere we would now call the Netherlands, and we know that he fought with Napoleon, because amazingly, he was born in 1788, and he died uh, in 1899. He nearly became the first person to live in three centuries. And I think what it really shows is that we've always had long-lived people. It's not particularly extraordinary to live a long, long time, but it used to be very, very few. So when Goethe was alive, we believe there were about 10 centenarians, people who reached 100 in the whole of Europe. Now we have 14,000 centenarians in England alone. And as I'm going to show uh, later on, the growth of older people within a population is such that two countries by the middle of this century will have between half and 1% of their population who are over 100. And that is projected to be Italy and Japan. So tremendous increase in the numbers of people who've lived long lives, but long lives themselves are not something particularly new. I'm sure many of you are aware of the two other long, the longest lived people that we believe, Jean Colmont of France. Uh, she seems to have the longest lifespan. She lived to 122 uh, years. Uh, and a man, Japanese man, uh, Kimura, uh, and he holds the longest for men, and he died at 116. And I think what is very, very interesting is that when we look at population from a national level, women consistently outlive men, and importantly, the two longest-lived nations at the moment are Japan and France, as represented also by the two longest-lived individuals. How did we get here, then? The way to think about population aging demographically is that we've just pushed back death further and further across the life course. If you look at this slide, the first dark line was from the middle of the 19th century. This, again, is English data. And you can see that there was death across the life course. In fact, half the English population was dead by 46 in about 1850. Now, half the English population will make it well into their 80s. We've just pushed death back to older and older ages. And you can see a lot of this has happened over the last 100 years. So the other way to look at it is this. Uh, this, again, is a, an English uh, statistic. And this shows where death is going to be going forward. And you can see that 2014, that is the darker shaded, already we'd pushed death well into later ages. But by 2040, you can see how we will stretch out the deaths in those very, very late ages. So Britain, along with Japan, along with many high-income countries, is facing this tremendous increase in deaths. And part of that, of course, is that there are very large birth cohorts, cohorts who were born in the middle of the 20th century, who are going to experience these long lives and then be dying in their 80s and 90s. But we're really pushing death uh, back. So we can see that very clearly. These are life expectancy at birth. Um, at the top, um, we have the women. And at the bottom, in the dotted lines, we have the men. And the two longest-lived countries are the Japanese women, who are the red line, and the French women, who are the blue line. And then we fall down to some European countries, the UK and Denmark. And on this map, we then also have the USA. 
And we can see similar increases if we look at death at age 65. Again, uh, France and Japan leading the way, and also at 85. But look at the difference. It isn't a straight line. It's very much up and down. And one of the things we're aware of at the moment is that life expectancy at the national level seems to be stalling. And one of the arguments is that it may be a statistical effect. It's never been straight up. Or it may be increasing inequality in our country. And we know from a lot of high-income countries, from the US, the UK, and the EU in particular, that it, our higher income populations are living longer and longer, but our poorer, less educated populations are, if anything, reducing their life expectancy. Let's look forward. We're interested in the future. This is a very interesting study that was done in The Lancet using WHO material uh, data. And it's important because it was a new technique, probabilistic um, forecasting. And let's just zoom in to the longest lived uh, countries and this is by 2030, the top 10 countries. You can see South Korea has overtaken France, Japan, but Spain is coming up very quickly behind. And this was a really important study because this study suggests for the very first time, life expectancy at birth in South Korea uh, by 2030 will be over 90 for women. We never thought we would go through the 90 barrier uh, for life expectancy at birth. And another study, uh, this also was published in The Lancet. This is using completely different data, completely different methodology, but it tried to look at the oldest age at which at least half of a birth cohort would still be alive. And this particular study suggests that the 2007 birth cohort will, half of them will make it to 107 here in Japan, and 104 uh, in the US and France, 103 in the UK. So although we are not quite clear what's happening to life expectancy, the data at the moment suggests that we will continue, probably at the population level, to continue to live longer. But the really interesting question is, what is happening to the oldest old? Are we seeing an increase in not only centenarians, but supercentenarians and super, super centenarians. Uh, and this is a very interesting study which was done by a colleague, uh, Rabin. Uh, again, um, he's looking at, at Japan. And if you look in the change in the distribution of ages at death, we can compare 1950, in this case, with 2000. And you can see the red line is where the distribution was in the 1950s, and very clearly, uh, over the last half century, we've pushed that forward. We have similar evidence also from France, the two longest-lived countries. Yes, we are pushing out uh, longevity. Some people argue, in fact, however, there's something to do with our genes, and I know we're going to hear more about that uh, today. Uh, in other words, there are some people who have a specific genetic makeup, which means that they will always live long lives. And we know these people tend to remain fit and healthy for far longer than the rest of the population, and then become frail and die typically just within a few months at the end of their lives. It may be a genetic thing. So, how do we put all of this together? Because today we're going to be hearing not only about society, but about technology and about individuals and about biology. And I think we are now beginning to work. This is actually some work we're doing with colleagues at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, we at Oxford are working with them. Uh, and we're looking at the relationship between the cell and society. In other words, the stresses of our lives, bereavement, early retirement, disease, actually does something to our cells. But we can, by using our environment, exercise, eating properly, uh, reducing our stress, we can then possibly also protect against the damage. So there's real interest in this cell-society interaction. But something else I know we're going to be hearing a lot about is what is technology going to do with this? Uh, both from genetic technology, biotechnology, all the way through to assistive technology. What is it really going to do uh, to our societies if we enable people to live longer, uh, fitter and healthier? So this is just a model that we work on at Oxford, trying to put this entire story together, because we believe you have to look at it multidisciplinary. You have to understand what is happening at this, the cellular level, all the way through to its impact on society, and even on the globe. So this is just a lens or a frame within which we do our research, where we try and understand changes in the cell, growth, maturity, and death, 
changes in the individual, the brain, the mind and the body, how that impacts upon society from a community, culture and economic point of view, and actually how it interacts globally. Because remember, as we looked at at the beginning, some countries of the world are young, some countries are ageing, and migration is that natural uh, balancer between fertility and mortality. But we also believe increasingly that we've got to look at it from a life course perspective. It's no good waiting till people become old. We've got to look at it from a biological point of view, from an economic point of view, from a social point of view, all the way across our lives. And we have to put it in the perspective of what we call this age structural change, the changing structure uh, of our populations. Because to grow old in a world that is itself aging is very different from growing old in a younger society. So what I personally work on is the area of society, I look at community, family, relationships, culture and economy. And I just want to finish by raising four key questions uh, that I think sometimes we neglect, but it's really important that we understand. The first one is this. It's the difference between life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. Uh, across the globe, as we have aging populations, we know the gap between living longer and living healthier in some cases, it's actually increasing. Uh, this is just some EU data, and the way to interpret this is that the dark lines along the top, uh, they are life expectancy lines, and the dotted lines, they are healthy life expectancy. And you can see very clearly um, in this particular case that if you compare those top countries, uh, so that is France and in this case Italy, and then you compare them with the bottom lines, you can see that it is between five to eight years of ill health that people have. They come into ill health and they live in ill health uh, for eight years before they die. And when we look at the same, but for 85-year-old women, you can see the gap has increased even more. And in the UK, there is huge diversity in the experience of this, so much so that our poorest elderly men at 65 they will probably live into their 80s, but all of their 70s will be in ill health. Whereas our richest men, age 65, they will make it to their late 80s and they won't go into ill health till they hit 80. So healthy life expectancy, really important. The second area, which is the generational contract, that is the idea that we have children and we look after them. They grow up, they look after us. Many countries are beginning to question whether, in fact, as we have longer lives, older pe sh people should bear more responsibility for their old age. In other words, planning across the life course and building up resilience. This area, which is called, represents generational succession. If we're going to have these very, very long-lived people, what is going to happen to the passing of assets and wealth and power within society? if you have got long, long generational gaps. What do you do if you don't inherit from your parents till you're 80, or from your grandparents until you're 80? How do we have to change our societies, our workplaces, our communities, to cope with these long lives? And finally, the long lives themselves. This is a statue uh, at Blackfriars Station in London. It represents uh, Shakespeare's Seven Ages of Man. If we're all going to be living, or half our population is going to make it to 100, in reasonable health, which would be a very good aim, are we going to change our lives? Are we still going to segment our lives? Education, work, retirement? Or are we going to have far more fluidity across our lives as we age? So hopefully that's given you an idea of the global, the regional, the country, and the individual. Uh, and I know from the programme that many of these topics are going to be uh, touched upon. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah, for so beautifully introducing us to many of the topics that we will be talking about today, and also for, do, for timing things absolutely perfectly. Very nice. So as you will see from your program, the Nobel Prize Dialogue is mostly about conversations in different formats. And we're now going to move on to the first of those conversations, a panel discussion featuring three people working in the social sciences. Much of our program today is based in the life sciences, but we start with the social sciences. And so I would like to welcome on stage, please, my three panelists, Angus Deaton, Hiroko Akiyama, and Yasuhiko Saito. Please join me in welcoming them.
also Chris Saito, Sakiyama. Please. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, so this panel gives us a chance to explore perhaps some of the ideas that Sarah raised in her talk. And having set the scene like that, I'd like to begin by thinking about how this broad demographic change is actually going to affect us individually. So may I start by asking Angus, what challenges and opportunities do you think this demographic change throws up for us individually? Well, um, lots and lots of things. I mean, it's a little hard to know exactly where to begin. Um, I'm an economist. Um, so maybe I should talk a little bit about that side of things. I mean, one of the things that's really very hard as people live longer than perhaps they thought they were going to live, and if they had many fewer children than they thought they were going to have, and maybe even fewer grandchildren, um, the question is, how are we going to cope um, as we um, get older, both financially and in terms of support? from our families um, and the people who used to look after us. Now, in traditional societies, there was very much a model in which the elderly were looked after within the family. And many people look back at that as a sort of paradise lost. I'm not entirely sure it was a paradise. Um, the kids and the older people often had divergent interests and weren't always particularly happy with one another. So for every story there is of a happy family looking after the elderly, there are stories of fights between women and their mothers-in-law and you know, all the sort of stuff that comes with that. So that model really, uh, what changes is eventually, as that model is no longer feasible, you move into social security systems which look after people. And so I think the big challenge, one of the very big challenges from an economic point of view of aging is how you fund it mm. and who pays for it. And it's a very, very difficult problem because the young people who are working um, have to support the elderly who are not working if that's what the elderly are doing. And of course, this can be helped a lot if the elderly are encouraged to work for longer. And mm. as people live longer in greater good health, there's no reason at all why they shouldn't be continued to participate. And these old-fashioned schemes that made us retire, um, you know, and, and take us out. But there's another issue to it, which is very important, is old people tend to vote. Mm. And that makes it very difficult, because politicians tend to cater to the old people, even though it's the young people who are paying for everything. And you yes. can see why that leads to potential problems. So just the economic and financing part of it, is, I think, uh, something we should talk about. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, let's continue with this question. Professor Saito. Yes. What, what, what first springs to mind as a challenge or opportunity? Well, actually, the, um, I'm a demographer, so you were asking me to ask about the individual uh, viewpoint. But for me, it's more on like uh, population as a whole and health as a kind of issue. And uh, Sarah Harper, uh, Professor Harper mentioned about this uh, health expectancy. And so length of life is important, but how long? And among those lengths of life, how long we can live in healthy? So the, uh, it's for us, we, we need to really increase, we, try, we need to try to increase the healthy part, not the total life. And that's, uh, that's as uh, concerned, and uh, that's something I've been working on. Mm. And, but when we talk about health, how do you define health? There are many ways to define health. And it used to be like a, a mortality is an index of uh, health. But now, uh, people with uh, uh, chronic diseases, they are living long and long with the chronic diseases. So we need to change our mind how to define health. And even WHO, 
they're uh, shifting their focus from the mortality to the kind of functioning. So as long as we can live and, um, or we can uh, um, uh, take care of ourselves, that may be happy. All, many old people, they, think, they say that uh, I'm happy as long as I can live uh, independently. Yeah. So how do you define health? Well, mainly functioning. So as I said, if you can take care of yourself, hmm. by yourself, without any uh, assistance, so that comes into the long-term care issues. And um, long-term care is going to be really a uh, uh, burden in the future in the many developing uh, developed countries. So as long as we can keep ourselves independent, that will help, I think, as society as a whole. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I think it's, it's really help the society if we can prevent becoming needing care. Thank you. Well, we'll certainly revisit this question of healthy aging versus life expectancy, or together with life expectancy, now and later in the meeting. But Professor Akiyama. Well, I mean, uh, definitely we face the formidable challenges uh, in rapidly aging society, but those challenges will be extensively addressed in later sessions. So uh, I'd like to say a few words about opportunities aging society offers <coughs> to us. Okay. Yes, I mean, uh, we all I mean, are getting older, at the same time living longer, and uh, we are healthier and better educated comparing with previous generations. And now we have to come up with a new life designs to live for 90 or even 100 years. And uh, we now have I mean, greater freedom to design our own life. So farmers, uh, the son doesn't have to be a farmer, or uh, the women I mean, don't have to be housewives. So each of us can design a hundred years of life to pursue a dream uh, by uh, fully uh, utilizing own abilities. And this is an opportunity our grandparents' generation didn't even imagine. So this is a new opportunity. And for society, uh, the current I mean, existing uh, infrastructure of the society was built when the population was much younger. So we need to redesign both hard and soft infrastructure of the society to, for meeting the needs of highly aged society. And we want to build a society where I mean, the people of all ages, not only seniors, uh, they stay healthy, active, connected, and most importantly, happy. Mm. And uh, for, so there are many uh, the issues we need to solve and also many dreams we want to realize. And uh, meeting these I mean, individual and the societal needs requires social and technological innovations. So I think I mean, 100, 100 year life society is a gold mine of innovation. And uh, the, uh, it offers abundant opportunities for both individual and the society. And needless to say, science is the essential foundation of the innovation. Thank you, that's a wonderfully positive outlook. Um, how does, how do, I'd like to get you two in conversation. How does that square with the financial side of things? Well, actually, I was going to back away from the financial thing. I only said the financial thing because I'm an economist. I'm supposed to say that, right? But I also want to take up the same point. You know, we, when we talk about aging, it's very easy and very quickly we get into negative language. I mean, the problems of aging. How do we deal with this? How do we finance it? What do we do with all these people with Alzheimer's in their old age? Right? But, you know, the, the first wisdom of aging is that it's better to be alive than to be dead. Right? <laughs> Being alive is really good. Being dead is really bad. Okay? <laughs> so the more people who don't die, the better the world is. Right? So the <laughs> aging is a really good thing. It, it's a great achievement and we should be rejoicing in it. And okay, we have to make some adjustments and we'll have to do things, but there's just this wonderful opportunities that were not there before. I always think I have two friends, one of whom is a Nobel laureate, one of whom probably should have been, um, who are economists who are now in their late 90s. And one is Bob Solo and one is Victor Fuchs. And their wisdom, which is still with us, 
And, you know, these are people I see and talk to on a regular basis. And they just know the most amazing things <laughs> because they're in their 90s. You know, these are people who fought in the Second World War. You know, they had that experience. And also they've seen the economy um, for, you know, 70 years of their professional life. There's one other thing that I've always looked forward to that didn't really work out, which is I think, okay, I'm going to live a long time. I'll get to see not just my grandchildren, but my great-grandchildren. If I live into my 90s, maybe I'll see my great-great-grandchildren too. But of course, my kids had their kids at about the age I became a grandparent, right, because yeah. of the reduction in fertility. So actually, I'm not going to see any more grandchildren than my parents did. <laughs> so that's a disappointment for me. But uh, l let's keep positive about this. And I very much agree. This is opportunity. You know, and opportunities always come with problems. Um, but the problems are secondary to the idea that we're living longer, which is a really good thing. Mm. Are you positive about the way that society as a whole is getting hold of those opportunities and making the most of it? I mean, what? are you positive about the way, for instance, in Japan, yeah, yes. that society is embracing these, these opportunities? Well, uh, certainly, I hope so. I mean, <laughs> uh, well, I mean uh, let me say a few words I mean, about uh, those uh, economic issues and health issues, okay? I mean, uh, and uh, there are many, I mean, macro issues, macro level issues like uh, economy, macroeconomy. Uh, but I mean, uh, the, I'm a uh, uh, social psychologist in training, so always I mean, I start with, I mean, looking from the individual uh, level. And uh, the, I think it's I mean, uh, from uh, individual perspective, I mean, people, uh, the perspective, I think, I mean, it's a, a building, um, socially inclusive society is uh, probably one of the key mm. to address these, uh, the issues. Mm. And uh, so, uh, for example, I think work, it's, uh, the working I, is, I mean, uh, the, uh, to me, the best, I mean, uh, medicine for healthy aging, <laughs> and also economy as well. And I don't have, I'm not saying the raising a retirement age, I mean, uh, 65 to 70 or 75. I think everyone, I mean, uh, they can participate, I mean, to contribute to uh, the uh, uh, productive, I mean, activities in the capacity each person can do. That is not for all the people, but people with a disability, or people who are raising young children, or taking care of all the I um, mean, elderly. I think everyone can participate. I mm. mean, um, uh, the uh, we, I mean, uh, they can work. I mean, comfortably. I mean, I think, uh, and that certainly technology can assist a lot mm. to. I mean, provide. I mean, age or I mean, uh, kind of I mean, a workplace. I mean, which are friendly to all those people with some kind of restrictions. Yeah. Please. In terms of this retirement age, I don't think we need to really limit. I mean, there are people who want to work. There are uh, people who, who, who doesn't want to work. So the issue is how to, how to maintain the life of those people. If they can quit the job and if they can make a living, then that's fine. But we don't need to put the limit, I mean, the retirement, mandatory retirement age that should be um, uh, handled by the individual. And uh, I, I think it's, it's kind of uh, the, the system U.S. has. I mean, they don't need to retire at a certain age. And as long as we can work, and as long as we want to work, I think that's a good, good effect on the uh, health. That's, uh, that's something we could, we could, uh, we, we could pursue. Mm -hmm. And so I think working is a is good one way to keep our health. Yeah, the physically and the cognitively and the socially, mm. I think it's the all the benefit. Certainly involvement in some way. Yeah, necessary. engagement and in the especially life. Especially yeah. for men. Once men retire, they get really <laughs> weak. <laughs> because that's because they lose the uh, ties with the society. I think it's you have to keep your ties with the society or people and social isolation or loneliness that really affect health. Mm. And that's something we really need to keep our mind. Uh, that we have to keep the uh, ties with society. That's very important. We are social beings. So uh, that's, I think, really important to point we have to keep in our mind. 
Now, all three of you come from a social sciences research base. And later in the day, we're going to hear, no doubt, uh, an appeal for more funding for basic research in life sciences. Is the same needed in social sciences? Is, is there enough known about the, the areas that you study? Or, or is there a, a funding crisis in social sciences just as there is in basic sciences? I'm not sure there's a funding crisis. Um, I worry about something a little bit different, um, which is with the spread of um, populist um, regimes around the world, um, the data are becoming much more difficult to get mm -hmm. and much more unreliable. So that, for instance, there's been a real corruption of the quality and availability of data in India mm -hmm. um, in the last um, few years. Um, and major numbers that apparently contradict the government's aims have been um, not released. So that we're losing that data. Now, the US is a good deal stronger than that, but I have no doubt at all that the Trump administration would restrict data if it had the ability um, to do that. So the data infrastructure is certainly not being increased. Um, data is not being made available as much as it was before. And there are real dangers down that route. I mean, one of the things many of you may have heard about is the administration is currently trying to put a citizenship question um, on the census, which will be collected next year. Mm -hmm. And the presence of that question would certainly undermine the quality of the data because a lot of immigrants would not answer the question. Um, it's also clear that the only reason you need that question is not for voting purposes, but to get the names and addresses of immigrants that you could send the police in to remove. So this is, this is very, very bad stuff. And if that goes forward, we will be losing on the quality of the data. So tackling these issues really does require high quality administrative data. Mm -hmm. And any threat to that is a real threat to any sort of social science and, and beyond, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Professor Saito? Well, even in Japan, we are having uh, some issues of data quality. So, but if I go back to the social science and uh, uh, basic uh, natural sciences, I think that the, uh, this, uh, it's, it's called a, a translational uh, research. That's something good for the society. If we emphasize too much on that kind of science, we may lose that the, I mean, that's why the basic science is not getting maybe enough, enough funding. Similar, the social sciences. I think we need to realize how important the social sciences is. I mean, um, technology can make uh, the society better, for sure. But even the te technology is there, human beings, we are the one using. And, and for the health part, then the, the, everybody knows smoking is not good. But still, there are many people smoking. How could, how could we change their mind? I mean, it's, uh, probably that's not technology. I think we need to study more on the human, and it's part of the social sciences. OK, thank you very much indeed. OK, we're almost out of time. But if you had one piece of advice for people as they move into this world where people are living longer, what would it be? Rejoice. Angus. Rejoice. <laughs> there are problems, but we can handle them. That's yeah. beautiful. Rejoice. <laughs> Lovely. Hiroko? Well, I think, I mean, uh, the uh, social inclusive society and also uh, kind of accommodating diversity, that's very important. Yeah. Being happy. <laughs> Rejoice in the diversity and be happy. What could be nicer? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Well, as I, yes, if you could go out this way. As I say goodbye to these panelists, we then move on to a demonstration. In our next segment, uh, Yoshiyuki Sankai is going to present his cybernics technology to us in a demonstration. And he's going to be interviewed by Sarah Harper, who will come back on stage. So there'll just be a little reorganization. I should mention that something that you are all missing, which we are getting the benefit of, is the beautiful smell of this lovely display. 
It's been newly crafted out of wood, and the wood smells with the heat of the lights. It's nice. <laughs> Sensory input is important. Anyway, if you please join me in welcoming Dr. Sankai and Sarah Harper. So, yeah. it's wonderful to welcome Dr. Sankai from the University of Tsukuba. Yes. <laughs> uh, and we're going to start with a demonstration, but this is not a robot. It's a cy cybernic system. Cybernic system. Yes. And I, I think we're going to start with the demonstration and then yeah. we will talk okay. about it. Yes. So, this one is the world's first cybernic system to con con uh, to connect the human brain nerve system to the robot directory, okay? So, okay, let's start. Okay, so now, if you wish to move, then the brain generates intention signals. These signals transmitted through the spinal cord motor nerve to the robots, and finally, robot will work. Please do it. Okay, so, but uh, uh, most of the patients or the, some of the very severe elderly person cases different. They lost the physical function or brain nerve function. Then, please relax and please do not move. Without the movement, according to his intention signals, mm. now robot, this system is now working. So this one is a wearable cyborg, okay? Yes, so it's easier way. but. Uh, so important thing is how to detect a very important human's internal uh, information is very important. Physiological and brain and physiological and everything, okay? Yeah. That is quite amazing. So you were just thinking? Mm -hmm. and, so, and just by thinking you could yes. get... So uh, thinking generates the intention signal and try to move. Then a small, very weak signal is transmitted this part, yes. But the most of the patient cases are different. The patient has some uh, troubles. Then a signal too small, or right. sometimes very sparse. So the, in these systems, these signals interplay and support automatically. So what is the difference between a cyber? Uh -huh. But system and a, system and a robot. robotic yes. system. Can you so, explain that? Okay. So the normal robots, okay, all of the robots, lo definition of robots, robots always have the autonomy, autonomous systems, okay? So computers always control it. But uh, this system is different. This system is human brain nerve systems control these systems. Mm. And this robot is attached on our body. Then, if the patient wish to move, then this robot synchronously starts to move. Right. In order to facilitate the synaptic connection between the nerves and the nerves, or nerves and the muscles. So, uh, even the very severe spinal cord injury patients and stroke patients, or the, some of the very severe nerve disease patients, uh, patients. Uh, Brain now function or the physical function gradually yes. improved. And, and, and I know you've worked not only with older adults, uh -huh. but also with children who've been involved in accidents. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the children who had a car accident, a, a child who had a car accident at two years, and over 10 years, he, he became a, a complete spinal cord injury, and he always used the wheelchairs. Mm. And his parents found a device and started to use this device. Then I was very surprised. Even the complete spinal injury patients, okay? So three hours later, so small movements generated. Yes. And finally, he started to bend and extend, and of course, the most of the part is destroyed. Then I think, so the combination in the, of the uh, regenerative medicine and such kind of innovative systems is uh, make our, our next innovation, I think. So, so in other words, that this, this particular child that you worked on, he, who could, he couldn't move his legs at all. Mm -hmm. He then worked with your cyber system. Yes. 
And then was there a long-term effect after that his brain, without any help, was able to get yes, him to move his anyway, legs? Yes, anyway, uh, over 10 years, so he, became, beca he lived as a uh, complete spinal injury patient. Right. There is no movements, no signals. But even these conditions, this system can trigger the uh, improvement cycles. And, and, and it's improving uh, sort of synopsis in the brain. Yes. Um, and, and the spinal cord and, and the motor nerve cord. and so on. Yes. And some neurons will establish the... Uh, some okay. And, and, and I know you've also looked at, at this um, with regenerative medicine using stem cells. Yes. So the, anyway, fortunately, uh, Kyoto University's Yamana, Professor Yamanaka's groups and uh, Tokyo's uh, Keio University's uh, Professor Okano's groups. So we had a, a MOU contract and so on yes. in order to promote these challenges by combining the, uh, such kind of uh, regenerative cell fields and these tech fields. Completely different fields now work together. So, so in so in other words, if, if, if you use this alone, yeah. there is some regrowth of the cells. Mm -hmm. But if you put it alongside stem cells, mm -hmm. uh, it improves the growth quite yeah, significantly? I, I think so, because the, of course, the, by using this device, some, uh, I saw so many uh, imp impactive uh, results, but mm -hmm. so, some of the very uh, de delicate part are destroyed. At that time, maybe the, uh, we should increase the number of cells, I think. Right. Yes. Now, now, you also work with something else. I mean, when, when I hear this word cybernic, I think of the Cybermen from yeah. Doctor Who. <laughs> Terrifying. <laughs> but you also have another sort of um, word from the past, which is HAL. Mm -hmm. And you have a HAL system. Yes, HAL. And, and Hi, hybrid assistive limb, yes. yes. which I think some people will also remember from another um, vision of the future. <laughs> um, tell me how HAL works. Uh, okay, HAL works. How, how, what is HAL and what, how, what, what exactly does that do? I've, I've, I've seen a video of it with older patients. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, yes, so today I brought this lower half bison, but uh, we have the several types, single joint and lumbar support and so on. Lumbar version cases. Uh, one, no, uh, one elderly person, 86 years uh, guy, person, he had a tumor and he had a clinical operations and he should stay on the bed one week and two weeks and more. And yes. finally, he cannot stand up the, uh, from the bed. So we started to, to use the, this lumbar type in yes. order to improve his standing up and sit down functions. Mm -hmm. and. We prepare only 30 minutes course, okay? Then uh, one month later, he started like this, normal. Yeah. So I was very surprised. So Japan, uh, last October, Japanese governments uh, decided uh, some directions uh, for uh, if the such kind of facilities yes. try to improve or realize the improvements then the Japanese governments will prepare some incentive to the, these facilities mm -hmm. in order to uh, increase the uh, independence of the elderly person and so on. Yes. And I mean, that would, would be a fantastic mm -hmm. um, improvement. I mean, it, it, uh, one of the problems I remember with my father, who just went into hospital for 10 days when he was 85, mm -hmm. um, and when he came out of hospital, mm -hmm. he had real problems getting his mobility uh -huh. back. Uh -huh. um, and, and a system which meant that an elderly patient would not suffer from basically having mm -hmm. to lie flat mm -hmm. um, could have real societal impacts because you would then get this person yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes, very important. So, currently, this device is now used in the hospitals and general medical insurance is now started to cover this treatment method right. okay, in Japan. And... So I just mentioned about the, such an elderly person's usages. In these cases, now we are trying to minimize and lighten like uh, clothes. Mm -hmm. So even uh, their home, they, I hope, <laughs> I try to develop such kind of system in their home usages. Right, right. Yes, so daily life uh, should be uh, promoted uh, to increases or to keep uh, their health, I yes. think. So, so this is a wonderful way in which 
technology and the human can interact together yes. with real positives. Yes. So, so what, what does the future hold? Uh -huh. where, where do you see this field going over the next 20 years? Okay. Or 10 years? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So now I prepare some vital sensing system to pick up the human's uh, very important blood conditions, the blood, uh, some uh, body fluid condition and so on. And we have such kind of systems. And anyway, I would like to uh, try to, uh, to try to realize the uh, mm, I, okay brain nerve systems uh, to the supercomputer will be connected each other and uh, analyzed and improved uh, data transfer these systems and <laughs> important things humans improvements synchronously uh, <laughs> copied right. to the uh, these robots. These, lo these systems also in, uh, uh, improved, I think. So I can see if this was introduced into Britain, mm -hmm. a lot of people going, I don't know that I want my brain to be read and fed into uh -huh. a machine. Mm -hmm. uh, is there such fears? Are, are those fears unfounded? Mm -hmm. And do people in Japan feel similarly? Or do you mm -hmm. think the Japanese population would be very um, accepting to mm -hmm. what I think some people might be a little concerned about? Uh -huh. Okay, so anyway, uh, okay. Currently, so Jap uh, in Japan, so so many persons love the high technologies. Yes. Yes, that one is a very nice conditions. Okay, so uh, I returned to Japan yesterday from Asian areas. Asian is also similar. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now we should consider the how to treat as very important humans uh, data and such kind of things they does. Yes. I call this one IOH slash IOT. Internet of humans and Internet of things are very important, I think. Right. So in order to prepare this uh, system to the human societies, then such kind of uh, harmonization of the human data should be discussed. Right, yes. right, right. So, so, so society should talk about yes, this. Yes, that's right. Yes. yes. And, and, and is it possible, I mean, this is obviously a big machine at the moment with all sorts of technology, but presumably going forward, we're talking about maybe a chip mm -hmm. that you could insert into your brain that would then do all the stimulation that your machine does. Is, is, is that, well, that is this the way that technology is going? Oh, okay, yes. So maybe, so anyway, the, uh, we can obtain such kind of very important data mm. and this will be, this this one will be a treasure of the uh, our societies i think so now i prepared also the very small uh, semiconductor test yes. so uh, this one is a very interesting so may, uh, maybe the end of this march uh, the prototype will be prepared right yes right. so that's one is the uh, really low, le low level energy assumption. So it's an easier way to uh, input just under the skin. Yes. So that one is also the one possibility to, for the very severe person, such as ALS patients or... Parkinson's. Uh, yeah, Parkinson also. Yes. And, uh, or uh, muscular dystrophy and so on. Anyway, mm -hmm. in these cases, uh, nursing care load is very high. Level, high level. So I try to reduce it to such kind of very severe situations. Yes. Mm. Well, well, thank you very much. I ah, think yeah. that, that has been amazing. Um, so can we thank yeah, you for thank you so much. fantastic demonstration? Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. Sarah, thank you. Okay. Thank you both. Hello. I would shake this chap's hand if he had one. But... <laughs> OK, so now, now we move on to another conversation. This one featuring two professors from Princeton University. I'm not sure what Princeton University is doing today without its professors. But uh, we have Angus Deaton, who you've already met, and Professor Anne Case, who's Professor of Economics and Public Affairs. And they're going to talk about morbidity and mortality in the 21st century. Please. Uh, join me in welcoming them on stage. Please. Anne? Angus? Thank you. And I should tell you that this is a special conversation 
because Angus and Anne are married. <laughs> Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're delighted to be here. I'm going to ask you to kick off. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about work uh, that resulted from something that we found surprising in the data when we were actually looking for something else. And we find that often that's the most exciting place when you come upon something you weren't anticipating. We were, we were doing a smaller study on suicide, and we realized that suicide rates for middle-aged people in the U.S. were rising. And we wanted to put that into some perspectives. So we said, well, relative to mortality overall, what's happening to suicide? And then we realized that suicide rates in middle age in the U.S. were going up, which was a, a stunning surprise. Um, could we have the first slide, please? There it is. So middle age, suicide, middle age mortality rates in general, we think, should be falling. That happened for the 20th century on average. Mortality rates for people age 45 to 54 fell at 2% per year over the 20th century. And for rich countries around the world, the European countries, the English-speaking countries, Japan, uh, that mortality rate decline continued into the 21st century. And that's what you're looking at there. You're looking at mortality rates, the risk of dying between the ages of 45 and 54 for rich countries. But what, what was going on in America was something very different. It was that in America, mortality rates for whites actually stopped falling and started rising. So uh, we thought this is really strange. We took it to doctors that we knew, researchers that we knew. We assumed that if we had found this, it must already be known. But it came as, as a surprise to all of the people that we showed it to. Um, and so we started digging. And we wondered, well, what, what is responsible for that increase in mortality? And what we found was that the three rates that were going up most rapidly were drug overdose, suicide, and alcoholic liver disease. So drugs, alcohol, and suicide. And as a shorthand, we started to call those the deaths of despair. And that's a sort of an, a, a title that sort of stuck with uh, the news media. And it's, it's happening to U.S. whites, which was also a surprise, because in the U.S., African Americans, on average, are poorer and have less education. Hispanics are poorer and have less education. So the idea that something was happening to this more privileged group that wasn't happening to other groups uh, really um, seemed like it was worth uh, pursuing. Because this wasn't like a one-year blip. This has been going on since well before the turn of the century. These deaths of despair have been rising since the early 1990s. And one other piece of this is that it's happening to people who have not gone to college for four years. So having a bachelor's degree seems to be very protective. But anything short of that seems to be putting people at risk. And it's not just mortality, right? This is just the tip of the iceberg. We've also found that in midlife, um, over time, people in midlife are reporting a lot more pain. They're having difficulty socializing, which is a risk factor for suicide. Uh, their mental health, uh, year to year to year, as it's measured in midlife, has been getting worse. So it seems that in this land of plenty, for people who, without a college degree, are not necessarily participating in that land of plenty, the world is not looking as, as promising a place. And all of the advantages that medical science brings to us may not be fulfilled. So, so maybe I can talk a little bit more about um, what you call the deaths of despair. Um, we think of these as suicides. I mean, there's people who actually kill themselves, but there's people who are drinking themselves to death, and there are people who are dying from drug overdoses. 
And as many of you will know, there's a huge opioid crisis in the United States. But these deaths from opioids and from other drugs, from heroin and from fentanyl, are the biggest component of these deaths, but they're not, they're, um, they're less than half of it. Um, and the other half is suicide. So one way of putting it is people are killing themselves quickly um, or slowly or sort of medium-wise with drugs. So if you look at this picture here, I, I should say one part of that mortality, we were talking in the previous section about life expectancy and the inexorable rise in life expectancy. So life expectancy in the United States has now fallen for three years in a row. And that's the first time that has happened for 100 years, which was at the end of this First World War and during the influenza epidemic that followed the First World War. So this is an extraordinary interruption in this progress in life expectancy and of aging. So, you know, maybe aging will not go on in the United States. Can, can I just interject for a second? The press, when they picked this up, made it a story oftentimes about white men dying. And indeed, it is happening to men. But I think it was very hard for the newspaper writers to get their heads around the fact that this was also happening to women. So the increases are almost identical for men and women, which also um, seemed like another piece of the puzzle that was important to keep in mind. But the big divide here is really between people who have a college degree, people who have a four-year college degree, and people who don't have a four-year college degree. And this seems to be the social divide in America par excellence today, that if you have a college degree, it's about a third of the population at this age, um, you belong to a sort of elite that's doing relatively well, and the bottom two-thirds who don't have a BA are doing not so well at all. This picture here has BAs on the right, and people without a BA on the left, and each um, line corresponds to a birth cohort. So if you look at the left, where everything's much clearer, the dark blue line is for people born in 1940, um, the next one is for people born in 1960, and 50, then 19, sorry, 1950. 50, 60, I, 70. My, my eyes are bad because I'm aging. Um, 1960, 1970. 1980 and 1990. And what you can see is these things are moving up over time. So these death rates from these deaths of despair from drug, alcohol, and suicide are steadily rising. So at the same age, if you take a 40-year-old, the, the younger cohorts are doing worse. And secondly, aging is getting worse for these people because they're tipping up so that as you get older, the effects of these things are getting steadily worse. None of this is actually happening um, for people who have a BA. So maybe we should talk a little bit about some of the causes or the other things. So tell us a little bit about what's happening to family life and so on. For people. So in addition to the fact that there's more pain, more mental distress, um, and the risk of dying from one of these deaths of despair, family life has fallen apart. That um, people without a bachelor's degree who might not have as good a job as their parents had or their grandparents have had, had at their, their age, are less likely to get married. And in, the, in America, that matters a lot more than it matters, for example, in Europe, where people will cohabit, but they will, those, those relationships are stable. In the US, those relationships aren't stable. So there's a lot more churning. There's a lot more, I will let you move in with me. We might even have a child together. But if you don't have a good job, I'm not going to marry you. And eventually, we might separate, and I'll look for someone who looks like a better prospect. So there's a lot less stability in home life than there once was. It's also the case there's a lot less stability in terms of religious life. America historically was quite a religious society, but people have left what are known as kind of the mainline churches of Protestant churches or Catholic churches. And at first they switched to evangelical churches, which are much more individual focused, much less community focused. So to the extent that, that your religion or your religious life was also a pillar in your life, that's also eroded away. In addition to that, and we'll come back, I think, to you on this, is that 
all of those things went together with the fact that the jobs that people used to be able to get with a high school degree, a job with, with on-the-job training, with a ladder up, with prospects that if you worked hard, you would be able to get ahead, those jobs have disappeared. Some of them through globalization, some of them because robots moved in next door and took the jobs, but those jobs aren't coming back. So the, all of those stable pillars have eroded, and we think that puts people at risk for suicide slow or suicide quick. But why, what's happened to jobs so and wages? We, we sort of pushing this into um, very contentious territory, but we think that what's happening in America now is that capitalism is simply not working for less educated Americans. There's a large share of the population, maybe two-thirds of the population, for whom capitalism is just not working. And we've just finished a book, or the first draft of a book, which should come out um, about a year from now, called Deaths of Despair and the Future of Capitalism. And what we argue is that there's been just a steady erosion of the power of ordinary working people in America um, over the last 50 years, that for people without a BA, wages have been falling for half a century. I mean, that's again something that really, really shouldn't happen. And if capital is working for everyone, it ought to be delivering more than that for not just the educated elite, but for everyone. And not everyone should go to college. Everybody who should, who wants to go to college and is capable of it should, but there ought to be a role in society um, for everyone else as well. And that's really failing, and we think it's political, we think it's power. There are no unions anymore in America to a first approximation. There are people who are not standing up for working class people. We have a catastrophic healthcare system, which is wasting a trillion dollars a year in um, basically making a very small number of people very wealthy at the expense of the mass of the population. We, and we in America don't have the kind of safety nets that can help people when globalization um, comes. Economists, and we're both economists by training, uh, like to think that there are gains from trade and that there are, the, the, but, but how those gains get split becomes a political decision. Uh, without, a, without universal health care, Workers in America don't seem to understand that part of the reason that their wages have been flat is because their employer is paying for health care on top of the wages. So if the health care expenses are going up and up and up, the worker is left uh, without a larger paycheck, but a, a large amount of money is being sent up into the health care system, pharmaceutical companies, hospitals especially, um, medical doctors, device manufacturers are getting very wealthy at the expense of these workers who are now not able to hold body and soul together. Let me just say a couple of final words. There are two huge questions here. Um, one is, is this some bizarre thing that's happening in America? And America is a really weird, bad place, and the rest of the world is safe from this. We don't know the answer to that question, but there are bad signs in various European countries. Sarah earlier talked about the slowdown in life expectancy. Um, life expectancy age 65 fell six months in Britain in the last, um, from the last set of estimates. Um, the pharmaceutical companies who've been addicting Americans with opioids are trying very hard to do this around the world too, and that's a huge um, danger. The second big question is, this is happening to people in middle age and younger than that. What will happen to the elderly? The elderly have been doing pretty much exempt from a lot of this, uh, people over the age of 65. So we really don't know, but the prospects don't look very good, of people in middle age, when they become elderly, will they be okay because they get their pensions, they get better health care, and so on? Or will they take this disease with them and you have a real problem on your hands, which is this aging society of increasingly sick people who've taken this malaise with them into old age. I don't know if you want to say anything. Um, no, it's not, a, it's not a very cheerful note to end on, but I think we have to end there. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for much food for thought and thank you for highlighting the importance of considering the social divide. So, so sometimes it's good to take stock and stop for a while. And we're now going to have a brief musical interlude. Uh, we're going to have a shakuhachi performance from Ray Jin, whose father and grandfather before him were shakuhachi performers. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
goodness. That was so beautiful. <laughs> One just wants to sort of be still for a while now. But we have a program to go on with. So we move on to our next panel, which is to discuss the question of why we age. And for this one, I'm delighted to welcome Liz Blackburn, Tom Kirkwood, and Tim Hunt. Thank you. At the end, Tom in the middle. Liz, do you want to sit here? Thank you. Thank you. OK. So. Why do we age in the first place? There's, of course, been a huge amount of work on this, historically. Um, let's just define what we mean by age in the first, to start with. Tom, what do, what do we mean when we say age in a scientific sense? Um, the way we define aging is uh, really from the property that as a human or an animal gets older, it becomes increasingly likely to die. So the, the definition is that as you get uh, older and older, your risk of dying goes up. So aging is a process of progressive decline in function. Um, and that's all the functions of the body that result in an increasing vulnerability to illness, to disability, and ultimately to death. And then there are many markers of such vulnerability, for instance... In, uh, in Liz's case, you've, of course, worked very closely on telomeres, the caps of our chromosomes, and those shorten as you go through life, and that's a marker of the vulnerability. And more than a marker, it also contributes to the many kinds of changes that happen in our many, many decades of life, starting actually from influences that can begin very early. Right. And one other thing to set straight before we start is... Does everything age? Do all living things age? This is a really interesting question, and the answer is no. Um, if, if all living things aged, then, then people might be inclined to think that ageing was just an inevitable process of wear and tear. Uh, but actually, there are some animals. The best studied example is the, the little hydra, uh, a freshwater animal about a centimetre long. And uh, people have for a long time believed that Hydra was rather special. It has incredible powers of regeneration. You can take an individual, cut it into tiny little pieces, and each piece will regenerate another organism. But the question whether it ages or not is something that's been addressed only in the last 20 years or so. Um, an Argentinian biologist conducted his PhD by watching Hydra in the laboratory and looking to see whether they increased their death rate, whether they reduced their fertility. And he found that, no, that did not happen. Uh, so he got a wonderful a PhD in which he was awarded the degree for four years of watching nothing happen. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like he should have got an Ig Nobel Prize. <laughs> OK. Um, OK, well, I suppose we might talk about what the fundamental difference between us and the Hydra is, yes. because that seems to be pretty key. But... Um, um, then, well, okay, given that there are, th okay, there are things that don't age, perhaps, but um, the, why do we age? Is it, is it an evolutionary program that we should age and die? Who okay. wants to take that? You can. Put Tom, Tom is you're right. the expert, uh, I think. Uh, 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 I think that. It's, it's long been believed, and there are plenty of people who still believe that there is an evolutionary program for ageing and for death. But actually, we now understand that that idea is wrong. There is nothing in the human body that exists for the purpose of killing us. The body is actually programmed for survival. Uh, and every second of our lives, all kinds of stuff is going wrong inside our bodies. In every cell, mistakes are being made. Uh, you know, damage is arising as a product of the chemistry of life. So all the time that damage is happening, we have these amazing maintenance and repair systems that are working to correct the damage. These are our survival processes. But we're not programmed well enough to survive indefinitely. And the reason for that is that in the natural world, animals don't live forever because they get killed by accidents. So you ask survival mechanisms, maintenance repair is very expensive. 
metabolically. Mm. So if you ask this just as a question about how you would design the ideal organism, how much should you invest in the maintenance and repair of the cells? The answer is you need enough that the body remains in good shape for as long as it has a reasonable chance still to be alive. So if you look at a mouse, for example, in the wild environment, 95% of mice are dead before their first birthday. So what does a mouse need for maintenance? It needs enough to keep the body in good shape for one and a half, two years, right. which is what a mouse has. And for a human, how long would we have survived in our ancestral environment? Perhaps 30, 40 years if we were lucky. So what do we need for our bodies? And that's enough maintenance to keep us in good shape through to age 30, 40, 50. So we age because it was never a high enough priority in our evolution to invest in the kind of perfect repair that would keep us going forever. So in a way, we age because we evolved a disposable body. <laughs> but it's important to raise the issue of sex, I think. At this yes, point. yeah, because you haven't talked about the fact because, that... Because, you know, here we are, we've, we've all been around for right. four billion years. Exactly. And uh, the answer is we have to rejuvenate ourselves yeah. once every generation. It doesn't matter whether you're a plant or a human being. Yeah. Uh, plants have seeds, we have eggs mm -hmm. or sperm, yeah. and uh, that keeps the species going. Yes. Yes. And that's surely that's what's selected for, is the ability to keep producing, because sort of by definition... Now, you're saying of, keeping of the body in good shape long enough to accomplish the, the next generation. Yeah. So, so on the planet, we're just a, a strange, unprecedented experiment when so many of us are living well beyond what you need yes. to accomplish what presumably was evolutionarily selected for exactly. if we to were reproduce. Yeah. Yeah. We would die when we <laughs> <laughs> laid our eggs. Right? Right. Absolutely. Right. So we weren't selected for this aging society. So now we're looking at what did biology hand us as a result of the selection for the processes that yeah. kept us alive long enough to reproduce successfully and bring up our young so they would then reproduce. So, you know, I love to think that on the planet we're a seven billion strong ongoing experiment that's never, ever been tried before. So we have to make it up ourselves now, <laughs> right? We've taken on responsibility because we're now the ones living this experiment. Yeah. And we can't blame evolution or anything like that. Now we have to say it's our, our job to do it as well as we can, as we heard in earlier sessions yes. today, I think. I think the, the way I think about this is that, you know, we're living in an era that evolution did not design us for. That's uh, e saying, evolution yes. designed yes. us exactly as you said, in order to reproduce, to, to make our babies and create the next generation. Uh, evolution never prepared for a world in which people are living to 80, 90, 100, 110. Uh, and this is because we've removed so many of the risks yes, of living. Yes, yes. Our yes. great brains and ability to harness so many things has enabled us to get past that. Glasses, I look at glasses, how many of us would have survived yes. if we... Exactly, if we were <laughs> with the eyesight we've we'd got, be dead. We'd, yeah, since. those saber-toothed tigers would have got us long before. So, so yeah. you know, we're a very artificially created evolutionary experiment now. So, uh, yes, yeah, so an obvious question is, having removed these risks, will we evolve to live longer? Will our protection me mechanisms kick in and make us extend our lifespans more? We've no. got to do it really fast, because evolution <laughs> timescales are too slow, but well, we can spread a lot yeah, of and things we've removed the culturally. selection. I mean, yes. as you yes. say, I mean, glass is a wonderful example of this, <laughs> right? You've just, just done away with it. Yeah. That's not entirely One, two, three. three. Only Adam doesn't <laughs> no. have glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that not true? It, it, it is possible that we could see future evolution towards increased lifespan. It won't happen in your lifetime or mine. Well, it takes how many take, generations, yes. Yes, I mean, this is a question that we... Aging happens because of trade-offs, um, because we're balancing, you know, what is good for the individual against what is good for the continuation of the species. But everything has changed in the last 100 years. We've changed our patterns of reproduction. We've changed our patterns of survival. So all the things that went to shaping the trade-offs that gave us our current aging process, our current lifespan, have altered. And I've looked at this with a, a graduate student, modeling what might happen into the future. And it's entirely possible that we could see the evolution of increased lifespan in the next 
10, 20 generations. But for all of us in the room today, I'm afraid it's a future we won't <laughs> see. But as Tim says, we've been around for 4 billion years, so in a way, um, you know, it's just a continuation. We should perhaps, it's a philosophical point, perhaps we yeah. should not consider ourselves as just individuals, but yeah. as, 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 as a long-lived species. But yes, yes. So, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think one very important implication of this, though, is that as we are living longer, and as scientists are seeking to increase the health span, the number of healthy years that we have in life, the fact that the body is programmed for survival, not death, means that we're working with the grain of our biology as we try to do this. So we, we've seen over the last 30, 40 years uh, an unforeseen increase in the length of human life because the idea that aging happens through a build-up of damage means that the process is malleable. Uh, and in the kinder conditions of modern life, we're reaching old age with less damage in our cells, in our bodies. And that's why I think we're all familiar uh, with looking around the world and seeing that people who are 70 years old today look you know, sort of much younger than people who are 70 years old when we were children. Now, now, why is that? Do you think that's just better food and better, more hot water, <laughs> refrigerators in the home? And yeah. Bed, uh, it's the whole soft package. bed to lie on. Better housing, better education, better food, education, better medicine, yeah. cleaner environments. A lot, of, a lot of damage comes from inflammation, inflammatory reactions. So if you go back 100 years, you know, we had a lot more illnesses, we had parasitic diseases. We have, we have less of that stuff. Mm. So we are actually reaching old age with our bodies mm. in better shape than yeah. has happened in previous generations. And the question we've already heard discussed is, you know, how much further can this go? Are mm. we approaching some kind of ceiling of the human lifespan, or could we push it further? And with medical science, could we be able to engineer enhanced maintenance and protection systems? We know already some of the things that allow us to enjoy better protection. We know that healthy nutrition, the Japan, Japan is the longest living country in the world. The Japanese diet is a particularly healthy diet. In Europe, the Mediterranean diet is favorable for the body's maintenance and repair systems. We know that physical activity is also very good because it's- But not too much. Not too much. <laughs> And social connection, uh, and uh, things like you know, we we use telomeres as a quantifiable measure of both positive and negative impacts, and we see things like you know, s adverse things happening throughout childhood can have effects that reverberate quantitatively well into adulthood, even middle age and later okay. ages. So there's a lot we are learning about what we can you know see quantifiably, and then say, well, we can think societally and individually, as mm -hmm. might be the case relevant, you know, which ones can we change in ways that will actually have impacts that, you know, this is just one quantifiable mm -hmm. aspect, but we can quantify these kinds of things, and that means the science behind it. You know, when you can quantify, you've got the ability to really analyze and do, do science at this biological level. So, so I think that we, we really have to um, now say, we, as you said, it's malleable. Mm. And what are the things? I mean, it turns out exercise. You know, talk about if you could sell exercise, <laughs> you know, you would be a trillionaire over and over. Well, that's very uh, simple. Exercise you is just cheap. need to get a dog. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> right. It's cheap. Exercise is really cheap. You know, you run up the stairs. And, uh, and as you said, not too much. Turns out you can do an awful lot of good with surprisingly little uh, you know, yeah, I mean, you don't, you don't want to activity. sort of work in the fields all day. That's, no, that's I mean, bad. I mean, sort of the kind of thing that actually tears your body into pieces is, you know, yeah. or indeed, heavy labor you know, is awful. But you know, chosen chosen labor is great. Actually, I think we have to start solving. I was thinking about this for the world and sustainability. Our other mm -hmm. huge thing that is going to impact our health, and that's all of the effects of climate change. Yes. When we think yes. of those effects, they're going to have big overall health hmm. impacts. 
So I was thinking we should combine our exercise by exercising and producing energy. But I haven't quite worked out. <laughs> no, I have a bicycle. Every, that, everybody has to go on a bike. Well, I have, morning, a I have a bicycle that actually <laughs> you, can, you can do blending of your food using a bicycle power. You just do it high speed for a few minutes, and your blended food, your blender smoothie, is produced. Liz, I think that's going to make you your trillions and solve the crisis. <laughs> let's, all, let's all follow you. So d does all this mean? One consequence of this is that I suppose we have to look at humans when we address this question of, of ageing. Yes. And all the, all the model animals we study, I mean, they're, they're relevant, but they're very different. No, We're they're in not a, different. No, they're biologically very similar, but their condition yes. is different. And their lifespans are different. Yes. Yeah. You know, 80 yeah. years, a lot of things can happen that never have time to happen yeah. in a mouse. Yeah. Now people are looking at mole rats and things that can live for several decades. Mm. But it turns out that the way they age might have a lot of individual features that, again, is not yeah. going to be directly transposable to how we age. But we shouldn't underestimate. Model systems tell us about the fundamental processes. <laughs> it's just the rates at which they happen. Yeah. I think that's the big difference. Mm -hmm. And we can't assume that something that's happening in a mouse and rate limits the mouse is the same as something that will be rate limiting for processes Absolutely. in well, us. Well, that, and I think the, the, there's another dimension to that, which is that we need to understand that each animal has evolved in its own particular ecology and circumstances. Yes. So to take a very practical example, quite a lot of people are interested in the possibility that eating less food makes you live longer. This is something that has been known since the 1930s for mice and rats. Uh, dietary restriction extends lifespan. Now, this is something that I've looked into a lot, and the question is, why does that happen? And uh, with a graduate student, we did some work that uh, showed for a mouse, it makes good evolutionary sense that during a period of famine, when food is scarce, the mouse shuts down all its reproductive function uh, because it's a bad time to try to make your offspring, and it puts extra energy into maintenance and repair to keep the body in good shape for when the food comes back again. Yeah. So that works as an evolutionary logic for mice. It doesn't work. The same logic doesn't work for humans because we have a rather different reproductive biology. And I think using the power of evolutionary inquiry to compare the aging process in model animals versus humans is also a very important part of this whole field of study. OK, thank you. That gives me a window to come back to the hydra, though, because I did want to come back to this immortal yeah. animal. Yeah. Is there anything that we can learn from the hydra that we can apply to humans, if you like, very crudely? The key thing about the hydra, and it, it comes back... In our bodies, we have two kinds of cells. We have what are called the germ cells, and they're the cells that make the next generation. And as Tim has said, the germline is immortal. immortal yeah. it, 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 it extends back to the beginnings of cellular life on this planet. Most of the cells in our body are not germline. They're what are called somatic cells, and they're differentiated. And some years ago, a colleague of mine took embryonic stem cells, which are close to germline, made them differentiate into somatic cells. And what they saw was that there was a comprehensive switching down of all the maintenance and repair systems, uh -huh. which was... It was a nice moment for me. This was something I'd predicted in a paper some 40 years earlier. So it's very rare in science you have the opportunity to say, I told you so. <laughs> but this was, for me, one of those occasions. The thing about the hydra is that the hydra has germ cells everywhere. Mm -hmm. So that's how... So if something goes wrong, it can just put in a new yeah. bit exactly. and, and replace exactly. it, yeah. which we can't do. I mean, my knees are still <laughs> radioactive from a time when there was atmospheric nuclear weapons testing. And the reason for that is that the turnover of uh, collagen, the things that... Right. I mean, this is why my knees are so terrible. Yeah. Right? <laughs> they, they, don't, the they don't repair <laughs> very well. They're, they're, I'm yeah. still, you know, still the proteins there that mm. yeah. were, were put in during that time. Or the brain. But there are ways that you can see that cells have of turning over, of replacing proteins, which our brain and, as you say, our knee are very bad at. Yeah. But because there are cells, and this is work from model systems in mice, where you see that other cells, like precursor neurons, are actually quite good 
at this turnover. Mm -hmm. So if we could wake that up for a while in our brains and do a bit of protein turnover and then put it back to sleep again, yes. you know. Mm -hmm. So studying <laughs> biology and model systems may really give us some terrifically good insights into keeping that repair mm -hmm. better and better. I'm, I, I'm not sure it'll make us live forever because I think our systems are so complex that you know there's just so many things that probably eventually things are going to go wrong, but keeping them in working order and increasing our health span, I think that's the goal as long as possible. Thank you. Fascinating yeah. conversation. In the last five seconds, any, seconds, anyone want to put a limit to human life in the future? Anyone want to put a number? Tom, you're the expert. I, I don't think there's an absolute limit. I think it's like you know, the world record for the 100 meters. Uh, you know, we've got the Olympics coming up soon, and hopefully someone is going to break a world record at the next Olympics. Uh, it's the same with lifespan, but we know with breaking world records, the, hard, the longer it goes on, the harder it becomes to keep breaking the record. Yeah. But we also know that drugs can help. Yes, we do, <laughs> and they may be able to help with aging. It's short term, right? <laughs> but, but, okay. uh, yeah. but Sorry. I think, uh, but as was pointed out earlier by Sarah Harper, huge numbers of people are living to be super centenarians. So now we have a distribution. You know, before the distribution was shifted to a much smaller number of average years. So the tail, the extreme longevity people, you know, were a, a rare tail. So now the whole distribution has shifted. So now we're probably going to start to see the distribution of those rare individuals. You know, it might stretch up to 150 years if the 110 is something where there are so many individuals, the experiment now will be played out on the planet of saying, ah, you know, it's a distribution. We might well get people rare, but up to 150, just as we found 116 was a rare number. Great. You'll, you'll be quoted good. on that list. The press <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> rare <laughs> is the word okay. rare. The, time, the timekeeper's breaking the time limit. Okay. I can't do that. Yeah. So I just have to thank you all very much indeed. Lovely conversation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And, uh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Tim, actually, you stay I on stay, stage. I you stay, stay around, on stage. Yes. So um, I'll go and sniff the wood. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. Now the audience is going to be made to work in the next session. Um, we're going to do us. We're going to see how oh. smart we all are. Um, for that, we need Tim, our guinea pig, Ryuta Kawashima, and uh, Yuko Fujigaki is going to be the moderator of this session. So please welcome them on the stage. Over to you. Tim. Where do we go? Where do you want us? Hmm? Oh, I will. You'll go there. OK. Very good. I'll go in the middle. Yep. Super. Now. OK. <laughs> Let us begin. Uh, being healthy is an important factor for longevity and well-being. Keeping our brains from aging is very important as keeping health. In general, the more we age, the less function of our brain work. However, is it possible to maintain the cognitive function or other function of the human brain? Can we improve these functions? We have two uh, panelists here, uh, Dr. Tim Hunt, a Nobel laureate in physiology or medicine, 2001, visiting researcher, OIST, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, Graduate University. And next, Dr. Ryuta Kawashima, director, Institute of Development, Aging and Cancer, Tohoku University. His main research field is functional brain imaging. Two scientists will give us some useful tips on how to cope with aging. OK, <laughs> Dr. Kawashima, uh, how can we know the condition of the brain? Yeah, so before we start, we, I actually prepared a one test that can measure your brain age itself. A brain age? Yeah, that's right. If I and have a brain at all, that is. <laughs> <laughs> and the task is very simple, mm -hmm. so count from one up to 120. One uh, to 120? 20, that's right. That's a lot. Yeah, very lot. <laughs> <laughs> then, after you counted, uh, after you finished, please look at 
the slide. And if you found the first line that is within 30 seconds, congratulations. Your brain is <laughs> same very, as the <laughs> university student, I right? See. Very and unlikely. Yeah, also the audience, uh, please do the task with us. And the task is uh, Count from 1 to 120. You need to voice it out. Are you ready? Okay, okay. so you start the stopwatch. Yeah, you that's say, right. One, two, three, go, something like okay, that. Okay, that's right. Okay, so you one. Count to 120. One, yeah, one, two, one, three, 120. Okay. Right. Okay. One, two, three, go. Okay. Oh, you're finished? Yeah. I used my fingers. I cheated. <laughs> <laughs> so, everyone finished? Now we understand that Tim has a brain young as 20 age. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> what about Fujigaki Sensei? Not yet. Not yet? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's too bad. And uh, this test is for uh, measuring the so-called cognitive speed. And of course, our brain has a lot of important cognitive functions. And one of the important ones is cognitive speed and the speed processing. And the, usually, the people has the most highest processor in the brain in age around 20. But, oh. it, but it's declined linearly for age by age. Mm. So I, I expect your brain age to be around 30 or 40, even <laughs> you are a novice. <laughs> <laughs> but I was so surprised. No, 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 no. But, I, but I, I, that, that's why maybe I'm fairly, or used to be a fairly good scientist, because mm -hmm. when you're stuck with a difficult thing, <laughs> the trick is to find a trick to go around the side, not to... Mm -hmm. Climb the mountain, right? It's better to find the pass. Uh -huh. Yeah, but we guess, or probably all the audience might want to know that how to keep your brain sharp. Do you probably have some technique or a special uh, no, habit? I, no, 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 no. I'm just curious. Uh -huh. I'm very curious. I walk the dog on the beach every morning, and mm -hmm. I like to look for uh, shells and, uh -huh. and pretty things. Let mm -hmm. me see if I have some. <laughs> with me, I think I have some. Yes, here we go. See things like, isn't that beautiful? Yes, very beautiful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I this, think that's, this, that's, this, that's this, one this of the kind of yeah. this is the kind of thing. And I also work on on problems. So mm -hmm. uh, that's another one. That's that's, that's a nice one actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can we? And, and, and this is interesting. So these, uh -huh. are, these are little shards. Yeah, you are um, in the pottery, shirt? yeah. Uh -huh. and, and it's always the bases that uh, survive because they have an extra reinforcing yeah, right. thing on them. You never get a full bowl mm -hmm. or a glass. <laughs> yeah. Always these little, these little pieces. Yes. Mm -hmm. So stuff like that. And uh, the other thing I do a lot of is cooking, actually. Cooking, okay. yeah. Because my main job in life now is supporting my wife. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so I have to do the, the shopping, the cooking, and the washing uh -huh. up. Okay. <laughs> so as to leave her free to uh, run the university. Shall we move to yep. the next stage? Okay. Okay, this test, uh, test. This test in a, test. enables us to measure our brain ages. Now, we all know that the uh, age of our brain, uh, what should we do to improve the function of our brain? Yeah. Yes. So actually, uh, we have a lot of ways to improve our cognitive function. And one of, one of it is the brain training itself. And I'd like to ask Tim to do... I prepared, brain training. Yeah, brain Exercising. training. Exercising. Are you, oh are you okay? Now you'll really find out I don't have a brain. <laughs> <laughs> and this time, uh, I actually You're prepared this kind of very device. smart, smart yes. device. And uh, this device could measure the actual brain activity so during cool. the, on, the, on the stage. <laughs> and I will ask Tim to uh, do some very simple tasks and put this apparatus to the prefrontal cortex. And we will see that how his brain is active. 
<laughs> Sasuke has a fleet. OK. Uh, yep. So this apparatus so uh, uses this very, very weak light, and we can measure the changes of cognitive function. <laughs> yeah, very, very smart. OK. Yep. Very good. So this is a little infrared device that measures the blood flow in my yeah. brain, basically. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Exactly. And also, we can see uh, his heart rate as well. So mm. if you are shaky, okay. then you will see an increasing of the heart so rate. So where is that going to Yeah, be I, will, I will explain on the, the task. Yep, on the screen. Wow. <laughs> this is really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so everything is ready. Then the first task. This is a very simple uh, so hand, hand movement, movement. task. Okay. So stone, paper, scissors. Repeat. Stone, um, paper, paper, scissors. scissors. Continue. Stone, um, paper, paper, scissors. scissors. Oh, but, see, Stone. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Stone, paper, paper scissors. scissors. Stone, Stone, paper, paper scissors. scissors. <laughs> 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 then, now we know that his brain is not activated during this kind of very simple <laughs> yeah, sequential hand oh, movement. Oh, is that right? Completely yeah? brainless. Yeah, so he doesn't use his brain. That's one. <laughs> then, next task. Next one is very simple. Ar I ask you to solve the very simple arithmetic problem. Uh-oh. Like, uh, I have to tell you, the only exam I ever failed in my life was a maths exam. Math? <laughs> wow. But no, and the driving test. <laughs> okay, but I prefer just a single digit okay. addition. Okay, well, okay that's, very that's, simple. Maybe we can manage that. Okay, so can we see his brain activation activity? <coughs> yes, that's one. So now everyone watch your brain activation. Okay. And the upper graph shows the changes of his uh, prefrontal activation activity. And the lower one uh, represents the heart rate. So mm. if he has some, uh, yeah, f yes, he. It's activated. OK, so let's try. <laughs> so simple additions. additions. OK. Ready? Yep. Go. Five. Oh, god, that's a difficult. Twelve. <laughs> Twelve. I uh, can't read that one. Uh, Fourteen. So nine. Nine. Eighteen. Seven. Yep, thank you. Five. Now, again, his brain is not active. <laughs> so, but of course, it's too easy for him. It's not that easy. Really? <laughs> <laughs> then this is the real task. Okay. Okay. No, so, have... prepare your hand. Okay. Stone, paper, scissors. Don't stop. Stone, Stone paper, paper, scissors. scissors. Stone, paper, scissors. Then, <laughs> during this uh, this task, uh -huh. I will present the uh, single addition again. OK. Oh. So do oh, the task right. simultaneously. <laughs> <laughs> OK? Forget it. You got it? <laughs> yes. So ready? Go. Ah, seven. Ugh. <laughs> Give up. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we didn't expect. <laughs> but now, but see, let's see that your brain start activating. Let's see. Nine plus seven, oh, that's 16, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't multitask. <laughs> You're asking too much of me. Really? <laughs> but you are a novelist. <laughs> yeah, 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 but that, that's not what... Mm -hmm. Nobel Prizes are given for people being lucky, actually. <laughs> not, not clever, just lucky. Uh -huh. <laughs> Noticing <laughs> things. Okay. <laughs> And this is what we call dual task. Mm. And each, each task was so simple, but if people will, uh, will do the, the task simultaneously, then uh, our brain may uh, get in some so confusion. So this has to do with attention, presumably. Yes. So you do need divided attention. attention. Yeah, that's right. So attentional problem itself. But also, if you think that our brain is like uh, the computer, then if you have some very small random access memory, then you can, your brain cannot do the dual task. Mm -hmm. Right. But you have a huge memory, then you can do dual task or multiple tasks because in you simultaneously. Because you, you distribute it among different e exactly. processes. So yes. that's another way to train your brain. 
Ja, so wie, how do we, how do we, what do we know about attention? I know nothing about brain science. Mm -hmm. I mean, is, is, there a, is there a sort of definite seat of attention? No, uh, we, we cannot see the direct the attention itself, but mm -hmm. using the psychological technique, we can measure the uh, degree or of attentiveness. Or attentiveness. Yeah. Oh, would you explain about uh, the relationship between the attention level and aging effect? Yeah, actually, attention level itself is also declined from age 20 because the most important uh, cognitive function in, uh, within, uh, are within the, our prefrontal cortex, and it is, it's declined from age 20. That's a natural one. But our finding is if you do the very, smart, shall I say, the smart brain training in everyday life, every day, then you can improve your cognitive yeah. function from, from in any age. But, you know, I bet you that that brain training just allows you to work little workarounds, like cheating, like the way I counted. I mean, it was really easy to count 120 if you count 12 <laughs> times 10, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which is easy to do. So, I, you know, I mean, I suspect that with brain training, you just learn little tricks like that so mm -hmm. that you're simplifying the task to what appeared to be two different tasks into... A, a single task. So actually, your poor old brain doesn't get any smarter. You just <laughs> inevitably get stupider and stupider <laughs> with age. No? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and the, of course, the, for example, in your daily life, you say that you're walking around the sea coast and also do the cooking. And the cooking itself can be the brain training oh, really? because cooking is multiple It's tasks. actually quite tricky. I mean, yeah. I'm always sort of trying, should I do this in this yeah. order? Yeah, and, it's know, the, same as the, the same as this one. Yeah, oh, exactly, really? <laughs> exactly. So it's a daily brain training. So if you... And often against the clock, actually, you know, uh -huh. because guests are coming at seven. Yeah, yeah and that's I'm right. I'm going to get the right. salad. Uh, can I peel the avocado <laughs> in time? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, did you want to... Oh, I, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Am I still thinking? That's the question. <laughs> thank you very much. Nice device. That's, That's good thank fun. You. Thank you. I'm sorry to be such a hopeless subject. Okay. No problem. <laughs> so, Dr. Hunt, uh, as a Nobel laureate, perhaps you could tell us when you came up with the idea of your research project, um, when, okay, um, have state of your brain changed since then? Has the state of my brain... No, I don't think so. Um, I, I think the... the, the it, in my experience, the difficult about being a scientist is finding a good problem mm -hmm. to work on. Mm -hmm. And it's rather difficult. I mean, I, I can't exactly specify what is a good problem, but it's mm -hmm. something that's important, interesting, and which you yourself could solve in a reasonable length of time. I mean, generally speaking, maybe something like five to ten years. That's a sort of... Thinking. So those kind of problems, in my experience, you only stumble on by accident. So no thinking mm -hmm. is required. Noticing. You have to discover things. But it's just, uh, you know, you, you, if, when, you, when you try and plan these things, for me at any rate, it just doesn't, it just doesn't work. You have, to, you have to wander around, do stuff with your hands yep. and, 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 and notice. Because, I mean, when my sort of Nobel Prize winning discovery, I was actually... I, was sort of, I realized not so long ago that actually I was sort of working on a sort of a, a molecular religion okay. is what I was trying to okay. do. And I made a completely, I mean, a discovery that was very, very important, um, which was completely unconnected with why I did that experiment. But I noticed something which nobody had ever seen before. Mm -hmm. And that, okay, that thank was you. terrific. And, uh, Dr. Kawashima, have you something uh, have we want to, do you want to uh, add something to improve uh, brain function? Uh, Myself? Yes, some yeah. concluding works, <laughs> words, or uh -huh. do you want to advise something mm -hmm. to keep our brain function? Yeah, okay. So actually, uh, we have several way, important things to keep our brain healthy. And at least we have the four principles. One is, of course, the cognitive fun uh, train your brain. I mean, the using your brain in your daily life. That is very important. Uh -huh. And the second one is exercise. And mm -hmm. in particular, aerobic exercise is very important. So uh -huh. you are working on the sea course. It's very it, good. It very is good, good yeah. yeah. 
And third one is nutrition. So balanced nutrition is also very important. Living in Okinawa yeah. is very helpful for okay. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the fourth one is the sleep. And research on the sleep is very new, but the good sleep uh, prevents dementia. That's quite sure. Really? Mm. Yeah. So the sleep is also very important, but we don't know how to get in a good sleep in a later stage of life. It's quite difficult. Yeah. Okay, let us close this session. We learned a lot. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. That was actually, I think, a rare insight into the brain of a Nobel laureate, because in my experience, Nobel laureates are selected for their ability to focus, not their ability to multitask. So, OK, so to finish the morning, uh, we're going to have a talk from Randy Sheckman, who is 2013 Nobel laureate in physiology or medicine, on uncovering uh, the challenge of uncovering the basis of Parkinson's disease. And Randy just confided to me backstage that he's very glad he's giving a lecture and wasn't subjected to that test. So please welcome Randy Sheckman. Thanks, Adam. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the recent developments in biomedical science have really revolutionized our ability to control the major killer diseases of cancer and heart disease. Uh, substantial breakthroughs have been made in recent years. For example, Professors Hunjo and Allison, who won the Nobel Prize last year for developing an approach to immunotherapy, have, these have shown tremendous advances in our ability to control at least certain cancers. And the future holds great promise for additional developments. In heart disease, through drugs and surgical procedures, lives are being saved. And this will be reduced as a killer in the years ahead. Unfortunately, coming along, increasing in severity, are the diseases of neurodegeneration, the major killers, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, have advanced as we age and will become increasingly a burden on society. I'm going to tell you over the next few minutes about an effort to try to understand the basic science behind the disease, Parkinson's disease, and what we can do in order to stem the tide, this inexorable tide of uh, attack on human health. So here's the Parkinson pandemic around the world as it is increasing in incidence. You see millions of people are afflicted and the future unfortunately holds the prospect of uh, more disease and uh, debilitation with as many as approaching 20 million around the world uh, over the next several decades attributable in the case of Parkinson's disease, to uh, both genetics and likely environmental influences, though not entirely clear. This is not unique to one part of the world. It is worldwide. It affects developed nations and underdeveloped nations. China, in the years ahead, is likely to experience half of the, of the world's cases of Parkinson's disease. And the burden, not only to the healthcare system, but to the care of individuals, those in the, uh, there are many of you in the audience who have experienced this, is going to be an enormous personal burden and burden on our healthcare systems. Now, unfortunately, part of the problem in dealing with Parkinson's disease is that it has been given one name, and yet it is likely many different diseases, which may have different origins. There are forms of the disease that afflict young people as early as in their 30s. And these uh, often suffer dementia early and die prematurely. There are forms of the disease that are late onset that affect the elderly, um, which can also advance, but often advance slowly uh, and include dementia. It is not unique to those who have the disease at an early age. 
So the problem isn't defining the disease. How many different diseases are we dealing with? The pharmaceutical industry has diligently attempted to develop drugs to treat the disease, but based on the assumption that it's a single disease. And as a result, many clinical trials of promising drugs have had little impact in prolonging life and in diminishing the burdens associated with the disease. Maybe the problem is that it's multiple diseases. We need to understand what the disease is. We need to understand how it begins, how it progresses, and ultimately how it uh, afflicts the individual and terminates life. Now, I'd like to spend just a few minutes describing the science of the disease to tell you what we know that is common to most forms of Parkinson's disease. If you look at this image, you'll see on your left a region of the brain, including um, a darkened region that is present in the normal brain. This is a region of tens of thousands of cells in the midbrain, referred to as the substantia nigra. The color, the nigra quality of this, is attributable to a um, melanin, uh, a pigment that's present in the cells of the midbrain that produce the neurotransmitter dopamine. Dopamine is an essential neurotransmitter that is required for movement and for aspects of cognitive function and, um, and, uh, and decision-making processes, which all eventually are affected by the progressive decline in the viability in the life of these cells of the substantia nigra. A patient who first presents with the movement disorder associated with the disease already has experienced likely over 50% of their dopaminergic neurons having died. So we don't even notice the disease until it's well advanced. We don't understand why these cells die. If there were a way to intervene to block the progressive death of these cells, it may be possible to contain the progression and uh, really almost ha have essentially a cure. Now looking more carefully at the cells in this region of the brain, uh, some years ago, Frederick Louis, early in the 20th century, discovered a structure named after him called the Louis body, which we now know to include proteins and membranes that form an aggregate that may be the basis uh, for the death of these cells. We know that Lewy bodies accumulate in the cells of the substantia nigra, and we also know that in many cases, these Lewy bodies can be detected elsewhere in the brain as the disease advances. So for instance, experiments in the recent years have shown that the disease may begin in the brain stem and progress as indicated by these arrows through channels within the brain to affect higher brain functions or the autonomic nervous system. We also know that one protein molecule of the Lewy body, a protein called synuclein, may be the basis for the spread of these particles within the brain. And experiments have shown, at least in, in experimental animals, that it's possible to uh, measure the neuron-to-neuron -neuron transmission of this protein. It's even possible to implant that protein into the brain of a mouse and to observe its spread throughout the brain over a period of several months. So this is one hint as to the possible the initiation and progression of the disease. But it is surely even more complex than that. Now, um, beginning just recently, in recent years, the Sergey Brin Family Foundation, because of a, an abiding interest in this disease on the part of Mr. Brin, uh, has devi have devised a program called ASAP, Aligning Science Across Parkinson's, and I was asked recently to lead this, uh, this program to try to develop uh, a broad spectrum of approaches at a basic science level. Mr. Brin has decided, and I certainly support this, that the problem is not that we aren't making sufficient advances in the clinic. The problem really is that we don't understand the origin of the disease. 
We can treat some of the symptoms, but we cannot cure the disease. Thus, we must have some fundamental understanding at a cellular level what happens when the disease begins. So here's the goal, to um, provide a scientific strategy and mechanism for directing financial and human capital to solve critical basic science questions within the next decade. Now, here's the problem with the basic understanding. Basic scientists, very often Nobel Prizes are given for a basic discovery. Basic science is underfunded. Scientists in universities and medical schools are often pressured by funding agencies to do work that may be seen as clinically relevant. And yet, it's basic science that leads to the uh, advances that will ultimately provide cures in the clinic. And here's a comment from a colleague, Dario Alessi, who is a Parkinson's disease re researcher in Scotland, and I'll show you just a, just a comment, a, a part of the comment. As he said, there isn't a lot of funding to do the fundamental <clears throat> research on one gene or one protein that would be needed to really understand these things. Funding bodies want us to solve diseases and work with companies to figure out shortcuts that can be made into a drug. But we really don't have the fundamental basis that is needed to solve these problems. His view and those of us who are committed to this research effort uh, will form the basis of this program funded by the Sergey Brin Family Foundation. Let me tell you about some of the problems that we see as crucial to develop a more fundamental understanding. There are aspects of cell metabolism, including metal ion or uh, divalent cation homeostasis. There are aspects of the uh, pathology of nerve cell connections of this protein synuclein, of protein uh, stability within cells, or the function of the mitochondrion, or the pathway that leads to cell death, such as may explain the death of dopamine uh, secreting neurons, or inflammatory processes that of often exacerbate the development of the disease. These are somehow interconnected, and the question is, what are the molecular influences that link these things together? Well, here are the pillars of the effort that we will organize going forward. <clears throat> At the top of the list are, is an understanding of the genes and thus the protein products of these genes that control genetic forms of the disease. It's been estimated that roughly 30% of Parkinson patients have some familial form of the disease. We know from genome sequencing experiments where patient materials have been collected from around the world that there are over 100 loci that may predispose to Parkinson's disease. This has been simplified to at least 16 different genes. That, that is, each gene encoding a different protein that may influence the disease. The protein synuclein that I mentioned is one such disease gene that has turned up in some families with this malady. We need to do basic research on these genes to understand their protein products, what pathways they serve in cells that we can understand in the laboratory. The second pillar of this investigation is an understanding of the neuroinflammatory processes that often exacerbate the demise of these dopaminergic neurons. This also seems to be a problem associated with Alzheimer's disease. Inflammation of areas of the brain may initiate or make the disease even worse. We don't even really fully understand the various connections among nerve cells that nourish, sustain, and ultimately allow dopaminergic neurons to communicate with other areas of the brain. So we need base, a basic understanding of the circuitry of the brain in the region of these cells in order to understand how these cells survive and what goes wrong as they die progressively as the disease advances. And finally, there is, for many Parkinson patients, an extended so-called prodromal phase that can be decades in length before which the pathology ultimately appears. There are some casual symptoms that are associated with the disease. A sleep disorder called REM sleep disorder often 
can precede by years, indeed decades, the development of the movement disorder that's typically characterized, characterizes this disease. We have no idea what the mechanistic connection is between this sleep disorder and the disease, nor the other symptoms that, um, that have been noted. So there will be an effort worldwide to collect specimens uh, of patients, to understand them, to try to devise tests that could be used in early diagnosis because, as with cancer, if a disease can be detected at a very early stage, the chance of viable improvement is extended. So I'd like to leave you with a hopeful thought that with this effort, a sustained effort, not only of governments, but of private individuals such as Sergey Brin, I am hopeful that over the next 10 years, advances can be made that will ultimately lead to clinical applications and that neurodegenerative disease will be contained as I am confident that cancer and heart disease will in the years ahead. So with your support and encouragement, we will move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Randy. OK. Uh, well, thank you all for being here for this fascinating morning. Uh, now that's the end of the morning program. We move to lunch, and Miss Kashiwagi has some announcements about what happens next. So see you all soon. Thank you. We have an announcement from the Secretary.